bit overcast. There was a bit of John, this this year marks, of course, 60th anniversary of the MG Car Club, and it's an, that's an important event to us. But for a lot of enthusiasts, you take uh, people my age, and so one of our first introductions to MG was uh, was reading your terrific book, uh, Maintaining the Breed, and that was written 40 years ago. Uh, I think of all the one mark books, it's probably the book that stayed in print the longest. Now there's a new edition available today that uh, that you've kindly donated yeah. to the building fund of the MG Car Club, and yeah. we're anxious to get a comment on that. But I think the title, Maintaining the Breed, and and I was wondering if you could comment on how you came up with that title and, and what it really means. <coughs> I, um, I don't really know what its origin was. So far as I was concerned, it was the the wartime advertising, the keep the name alive through the war advertising. Um, maintaining the breed, there would be a hunt scene, a couple of horses and a couple of hounds and people. Um, blow me down, I can't... I, I, but that sort of theme, um, maintaining the breed, obviously, but the byline of this series of advertisements, which were purely line drawings, um, very good line drawings, and I don't know who did them for my sin, uh, because I, it was done during the war and I wasn't there, I, I was off in the army. Um, now that's where maintaining the breed came from. It was used as, uh, as the company's advertising tagline through the war. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, well, anyway, it's a... It's I, 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 sorry, I applied it to the book <laughs> that the, uh, the racing um, sphere um, promoted so much the design of the vehicle. Uh, if anything maintained the breed, it did. And my book was all about the racing history. Sure, the competition cars. Mm -mm. Uh, and uh, how important were the competition cars to the success of, of MG as, as a commercial entity? It's a, a very interesting question when you consider the, the overall years. We, from 1930, to 1934-5, we competed intensively in international events and made our name and reputation. Uh, the wise financial boys cut us off at that point. Um, but I think that that, that is when the, the basic work went down, uh, when MG became a, a, a worldwide name. How about after the war, uh, when uh, you had a chance to, uh, to, to make your mark and, yes. uh, and get cars involved in competition and record breaking? Yes, well there, there are two, two aspects uh, of that. One is the um, what, great increase in export proportion of what we made because of the uh, financial position of the country. Um, the watchword was export or die. Um, we were under strict rationing of steel, and the amount of steel that the government permitted us to have was dependent upon our export uh, potential, our export achievements. And so, in that particular instance, the TC went to the United States in some quantity. They gave us steel with which we made the Y type for sale on the home market. You see? So there's that, that aspect of it. Now, the, the question again, which I've... Well, I just, you know, the, uh, the importance of competition and the record-breaking after the war. Do you think it was important in, let's say, in the 50s, uh, getting re-established, uh, the, uh, the Goldie Gardner attempts and then the EX-179 especially? Uh... These, these, were, um, these were pot boilers to keep the name before the public. Right. Yes. Right. Yes, yes. And uh, would that sort of advertising been, been used quite a bit on the continent as well as here in England and in the United States? Oh, I think so, yes. Yes, yes, certainly. Okay. Certainly in, in the United States. Yeah. I know before the war, uh, one of your main jobs uh, was in the service department and uh, the customer uh, and the... Idea. I was in the front line. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 
satisfying the customer is very important. And, I, it, yeah. and I've been told stories that the customer could actually, if he had a problem with his car, just show up here at the factory and he'd be taken care of. How oh, did, did. Oh, how absolutely. Did that, how did oh, that yeah. work? Generally speaking, we'd like them to make an appointment, but yeah. they came in. Uh, and we worked Saturday mornings, which was the day when <laughs> so many people, the only time that they could come to the factory. There were a pr procession in uh, across the road there uh, of a Saturday morning for probably for minor uh, either advice, chit chat, or for tune, the, tune the carburetors outside, tune, I've got a noisy axle. Um, the chap I didn't like to see very much was the fellow that came in and said, well, my steering tramps at 65 miles an hour, let me show you, and it was a foggy November day. <laughs> this made me absolutely case hardened as a passenger. I, I can be driven by anybody now. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Could you maybe just give me a quick rundown of your history with MG? You know, start from the car club to your uh, activity at the, at the factory and then becoming the well, chronology. Uh, yes, all right. Well, um, born 11th of June, 09. Um, at the age of two, my parents divorced in a very spectacular fashion. And arising out of that, a trust was made up, uh, of which I was the beneficiary. Uh, it was to provide for my education. At the age of 21, there was a balance of the trust left over, which came to me. And that, plus my old Ricardo Triumph motorcycle, bought me my first M-type midget. Um, I was, at the time, uh, with the London firm of accountants, Pete Marwick, Mitchell and Co. Uh, there'd been a great battle in my last days at school because my school thought I was going to be a pure mathematician and I'd got to read science for, for, uh, for uh, Cambridge. Um, my father said, your, your future money lies with accountancy. And he won in the end. And so I, uh, I spent three years with Pete's. Um, and when I'd been there too, uh, I bought the, the M-type midget. Um, I came up to Abingdon to see Cecil Kimber to see if he uh, uh, approved this car club, and he did. Um, with all the pressures on my time, uh, trying to be an accountant, attending the London School of Economics to read for a B.com degree, and trying to run the MG car club, something I had to give. And so I said to Kimber, look, um, either find somebody else to run the club or give me a job. And after about a year's pressure, come November 1931, he did. And I went into the service department at, at Abingdon. Um, <laughs> After the service department, uh, uh, <coughs> would, it, would you have been with the service department up until the beginning of the war? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. From the, the moment I got there, well, <laughs> silly thing, really. I, I turned up at the factory. That, that's what I had intended to say. Yes, I, I came down to see Cecil Kimber over the club. Ultimately, he, he offered me a job. Um, I gave, gave him that notice at the accountants in the city uh, and sent my father a postcard and told him I'd gone to Abingdon, you know, because I, I, I felt the, the oncoming wrath. But it wasn't, it was all right. He said, oh, well, perhaps. <laughs> He's made his own mind up, so that's all right. Um, now, you, you said that well, I, just oh, yes. yeah. I went into the service yeah. department then and I stayed until the outbreak of war. Um, as I was introduced to the company, Kimber said, now, um, look, you're coming to join, to run the MG car club, but that won't take you all your time. In your spare time, you can assist the service manager. Before, I, before you go down there, I'd like you to see George Propert, general manager. So I went to see him and he said, well, now, look, you will assist the service manager, but that won't be a full-time job. In your spare time, you can run the MG car club. That was the basis in which I began working for Nuffield, MG, you will it. Um, never got any better, really. But I went into the service department, and with the company expanding as rapidly as it was, uh, I very soon became completely involved in customer satisfaction. And MG Car Club went to blazes, you see. So Kimber got somebody else in to run the MG Car Club, and that was Alan Hess. And I soldiered on as um, service manager. 
when the company closed uh, for the war or, or took on other work, stopped manufacturing automobiles. Yeah, I'd gone. You, you'd gone. I'd on, gone. I was, uh, the, yes. I was in emergency reserve and I was called up in, what, early days of October 39, yeah. And, and I didn't reappear until late 46, early 47. Was late 46 with yeah. the, with the mm. Karka. And, and you came back in what capacity then? Uh, Interestingly, that, that, that is a rather interesting story in that the rules and regulations for, the, uh, for Morris Motors, of which we were then a part, uh, was that anybody who was called up into the services was virtually going from one, one uh, job to another. There was no financial stringency, therefore goodbye, God, God bless you, you see. But it did carry with it re-employment rights when the war was over. Um, on the other hand, if they fired you uh, because they were re reducing the overall, over, overall staff, uh, then you were paid a month's salary for each year's service. Um, time came very uh, early in the, after the outbreak of war in '39, when Kimber had us in one at a time and said, look, uh, the future is very uncertain. Um, we've got to make up our minds to keep some and not others. Uh, we decided to keep you. And I said, thank you very much, and uh, left. Um, following morning, my call-up papers arrived for the, for, the, for the army. So I went back to him that morning and said, um, I, I don't want to know, he said, go away. I thought, right, what have I done now to deserve this? However, I went back down to the department, and about two hours later, I got a little chit which fired me, you see? <laughs> and that meant I got nine months' salary, and I was able to leave having without a, what, without a spot on my escutcheon, you know, financially, yeah. <laughs> and then when you came back? When I came back, I had no re-employment rights, so I had to come cap in hand, actually. But, uh, then, oh, well, then. What did you do then after the war? Oh, I was uh, service manager, sales and service manager, assistant general manager, then general manager, and four years after that, director and general manager. Yeah. And so that uh, I was, I was general manager of the company. Twenty-one years, I think, almost to the day from when I joined it, and was a director twenty-five years to the day from when I joined it. That's that was the. Mm. And you finished at MG in 1969? Six, 1969, yes, on my 60th birthday. Yeah. yeah. So one. over the history of all the MG cars, which ones were your favorites? Which ones did you like? Uh, in point of fact, um, the, the car that I've got, the, the, the MG BGT, uh, that is the car that I had my sights on, oh, for years. Um, and I tried to steer design in that direction. Uh, what had inspired it, I don't know what year it was, perhaps 1953, you know, 4, something like that. The, the, the DB24 Aston Martin, three of them had run as a team at Silverstone in a, a, a pr production car race. And they'd fascinated me running one, two, three. I, I said, that's the shape, that's what we want to do. So let's try and build the poor man's Aston Martin. Um, we had to build then the, the TD and the TF and the Y-type. No, we were already building the Y-type at that time, but the, certainly the TD and the TF and then the MGA before we got around to the MGB. And then four years after that, the one with the top off. See. But, um, that, so I must say that the MGB GT is, was my favorite car. <laughs>